Hi, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. I'll start by very briefly introducing uh, this uh, seminar series, Outside In. Uh, it's uh, it's an attempt to um, uh, you know have more talks and engagement uh, in the context of thinking outside of the lab uh, and studying nature and biology uh, from the outside. Uh, many times, as you'll see in today's talk, these explorations lead us back into the lab. Uh, and that's uh, also uh, gives us even more insights about what's happening outside. So Outside In was uh, was initiated by Professor Saudamini, um, um, who is a, who's a faculty at, uh, as a professor at NCBS, but uh, with a deep interest and passion for uh, ecology uh, and evolution biology. So uh, thanks Saudamini uh, for starting this series. We've had a bunch of talks this month um, and this is actually the last one in this series that I have been involved in. And I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome and to present to you uh, Dr. Farah Ishtiak, who's a faculty at the TICS, the Tata Institute of Genetics and Society. Uh, Farah has a very uh, interesting background and she's one of the few, maybe one or two disease ecologists, bona fide disease ecologists in India. So it's a really a pleasure and privilege to be uh, able to hear from her. Farah did her PhD at uh, Aligarh Muslim University and subsequently worked uh, across the world, uh, you know, in the Smithsonian, at Oxford University, at the Wildlife Conservation Society's, uh, you know, health program, uh, and uh, most recently at the Center for Ecological Sciences as an intermediate uh, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Fellow. So over the past year and a half or so, she has been at, at the TICS and here she is um, hoping to take on a very ambitious and exciting program looking at uh, Paris, uh, looking at vectors. Uh, and we'll hear maybe a little bit more about it, but today Farah is going to talk to us about her longstanding work on uh, birds uh, and uh, uh, diseases that they carry, Farah. Thank you, Uma. Can you hear, am I audible? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, Thanks to you and thanks to Sodhamini for inviting me to give this talk and also uh, Bangalore Life Science Cluster Communication, especially Pavitra for organizing this. It's a great opportunity and I have watched most of the talks very excitedly and they have been really, really informative and interesting. So I hope I can do justice today by maybe igniting some kind of passion by showing the work I do on birds and as well as on their parasites. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay, yeah, right. Right, so yes, I am a trained bird biologist. I never thought I will do disease ecology. In fact, I never heard of disease ecology 20 years back. And all I wanted to do is you know, study ecology and behavior of birds because that's what the one way of dealing with the conservation, protecting their environment, looking into habitat and learning about their health behavior. And also finding out what actually drives their distribution and how they're dependent on their environment. And I thought one of the ways to do would be to learn genetics because combining the DNA studies with the bird work, I think would be an exciting way forward. It can answer some of the questions. So I actively looked for postdocs and I stumbled upon one of my postdoc, which changed my life. And I'll tell you how and he, how it did that, how intriguing this whole system has been. So before I go ahead, I want to troubleshoot some of the terminology which I'll be using in this talk. So just to, for the sake of uh, making it easier for everyone to be on the same page. Yes, I'm gonna talk about parasites, but the whole parasite world right now, which I'm gonna talk about is hinges on this migration. So. Here we are dealing with migration. I mean, lots of animals, they migrate every year. Birds do, some mammals do, and even butterflies do, right? So it's a seasonal movement of animals from one region to the another. And they take this journey. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, sorry. Could we maybe sure. go to slideshow mode? Oh, have, are you not yet? Am I not yet? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think you're in, yeah. Is it fine now? Yeah, okay. Yeah, fantastic, thanks. Yeah, great, thank you. So. They do that and given that whole migration it can be very challenging as well because they deal with predation, it's a physiological stress, they have to be in very good condition to cope with the 
environment and the competition, you know, in the new sites where they are going to. Yet they do it every year. I mean, it's evolutionary selected for. So there must be benefits of that. So how migration has evolved and why they do it has a very important significance to that is because they want to avoid extreme temperatures. So most of the migration that happens is from north to south when it gets too cold in the north. These birds, they go to the southern environment looking for exploiting food resources. But apart from looking for good habitat and spending time there and avoiding this, the, one of the reasons which has been also when they migrate back is to escape from diseases as well, so the parasites. So they're in the north where they're breeding and then they go to the southern environment where temperature conditions are there. They deal with a lot of parasites, but they just in time for the breeding, they again migrate back to their breeding uh, uh, locations. So they do this journey every year, basically. And so not to confuse the migration with the dispersal, which is something very different where birds just dispersed to the localized area when they leave the nest. So migration is a, just a seasonal movement with the change of season and with the environment. And the reason it ties very well with the disease ecology that when you migrate, you are basically exposing yourself to a suite of parasites of different, all kinds of parasites. So basically you are exposing yourself. You can get infected with anything or everything basically. And this has a huge impact on the bird populations, on their uh, distribution, and also how they, how they sort of cope with it. And this triangle of interaction between host, pathogen, and their environment is actually forms the disease ecology in the context of environment and evolution. And I would like to highlight that this is one of the areas, as Uma just mentioned, is very much not discussed or you know, even explode in Indian context. We know that we have some of the diseases like uh, rabies or malaria or dengue, but we don't understand how these parasites actually interact with their host or with the environment, what triggers that. We just know that, you know, monsoon comes and we see rise in dengue cases, but actually what happening there, how it's all evolving or what might be triggering that, we don't have any of those information. And actually that's very important if we want to deal with or if we want to control or mitigate any disease in our environment. And whenever anybody talks about the bird declines or extinction, actually, these are the main reasons which have been put forward, like you know, growth of population, habitat loss or habitat destruction, pollution is also one of them which actually are very much actually influencing the bird population. And very recently, you all must have heard the veterinary drug, which actually led to the decline of these three species of gyps vultures in India. But disease ecology, actually, it never comes forward as one of the reasons. This image which you are looking here, which says 33% is not from India, it's from all across the globe based on BirdLife International data. And uh, when we are looking into now climate change and habitat loss, actually disease is the forefront of everything because with the loss of environment, with the disturbance of habitat, lots of expansion in pathogen and their vectors has taken place and it will, and it is actually already infecting a lot of population. I'll tell you how that's happening. So birds migrate and Based on this is a graphic I'm showing you, just to give you an idea how the migration flyways, because they are, they're not sort of fixed as they have been depicted here, but it just gives you a generalized idea, you know? So there is a central Asian um, uh, highway here, which most of the birds which are breeding in this area, they come and they winter in the Indian subcontinent here. This is the East Atlantic. So all the North American, uh, sorry, the East Atlantic, which is these European birds, they go into Sub-Saharan Africa. And then you have these, America's flyway where the birds are going to the Pacific uh, or flyway which is going to the South America. And the idea behind this flyways is that, that it, when people who are, birds are not going from point A to B, they do have lots of stopover sites where they fuel as well. And those sites are really critical for their conservation, protection of these sites. By having some kind of these flyways allows us or help us to sort of, you know, uh, collaborate or inform those uh, government or the people that you know we need to protect so it's sort of kind, of kind of form a framework where everybody can come together and help in protection of these uh, their habitat so 
I have, I apologize, I have only one slide where I have some text, but I think I would like to drill this idea of how I'm approaching this talk. So I would like to introduce two concepts here. What makes a parasite or a disease so prevalent in a population? And it's not that, even that everything is everywhere, still the parasite dynamics and how they transmit in a population is very much dependent on the parasite biology actually. So for example, um, and I'll give you an example for both of these in a bit. So one is called the density dependent transmission, basically. So here these are the you know, contagious diseases like avian influenza, which relies on the host density and uh, which if you have infected hosts, they infect the susceptible or uninfected host. Pretty much like COVID, you know, we have, that's why we are doing social distancing and trying to keep our two feet distance from each other. But there is also another kind of parasites, which are the frequency dependent transmission, which actually don't rely on the density, but just the, you know, occasional or these mean number of contact rates. And most of these vector borne diseases actually fall into this bracket. So where they, they are vectors, they sort of, they go and they bite. It's just the frequency, the way they bite basically or is, drives the circulation of those parasites in a population. Of course, if given the number of hosts which are infected as well. So I will be giving you two examples of this. This is one is the based of this uh, avian influenza work, which I did more than 10 years ago now in Mongolia. And it's a very fantastic country. So you can see Mongolia is sort of in between Russia and China. The interesting thing about Mongolia is that Mongolia has hardly any poultry farming, basically. If I draw a map of all the poultry distribution here, Mongolia really stands out. And yet Mongolia has, since 97 or 95, they have N number of outbreaks of uh, avian influenza outbreak. And this is also highly pathogenic H5N1 outbreaks. So when I, and you can see the people also lead a very nomadic lifestyle. They are, the, they are the yurts, they just move around. They follow the vegetation or where the, depending on the season, they have these horses. And there are a lot of iconic species also, which are part of the landscape, like this white naped crane. They also have snow leopards or, and, and then a moon falcon, you know, they breed over there. So it's a fantastic landscape. And yet you have these uh, avian influenza outbreaks have happened. And the reason for that, they, Mongolia has a very unique ecology that they have a network of these salt lakes, which are all around the, on the, on these, in this country. And these salt lakes, they attract a large number of geese and ducks from China and other parts nearby, which come and they breed here. Now, since that happened, so you have, uh, say, ruddy shell duck or bar-headed geese, even hooper swan, and uh, other water birds and black-headed girls also, they breed there. And occasionally you find there has been outbreak and there are dead lying birds actually lying on the shore of these birds. So as part of one of my work, which I did for with the Wildlife Conservation Society, we were looking into this active and passive surveillance, looking for the signatures of this H511 where can we figure out, is it really the wild birds which is driving the outbreak of the disease or can it be because of the poultry, considering poultry is so negligible in number. So we were collecting the fecal samples around the lakes. We also collected samples of these dirt, uh, dead birds. And uh, also we did necropsy, you know, looking for the samples of the different birds uh, from the thing. And what we found that pretty much all the dead birds, which were as part of the passive sampling, they had H5N1 in them. So they died of this basically highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. There are also low pathogenic virus, which don't kill the birds, but sort of uh, live with them and their immune system gets suppressed, but H5N1 was the main cause. So what we concluded that whenever there has been, and it, it, and it ties very well with the outbreak, poultry outbreak in China. So whenever you, they've had a outbreak of uh, H5N1 in China, and these birds have migrated, it, they brought the virus with them and it, it led to the a lot of uh, outbreak in these environment. And because Mongolia is such a cold country and this lakes do freeze in winters and it's saline water, it sort of makes it a very nice habitat even, in, even to virus to stay even over winter. So next year when it, the snow thaws, it sort of becomes active and it can infect another batch of birds basically. And when these birds 
like bar-headed geese or radishal duck, they migrate, they winter in India. I mean, look at this bar-headed geese. I mean, this is a beautiful map done by Eber, Bird Count India. It shows you pretty much whole population from here coming to India. And if few individuals are infected with H5N1, N1, they bring the virus with them. They can, they, that's when you see this sign of uh, outbreaks of uh, avian influenza in the poultry. So here is just one example I'm telling you, not all birds are involved in the transmission of parasites, but yes, it, depending on the parasite, what they're carrying, it can be a problem. And here in this case, influenza being such an infectious agent, it does cause uh, outbreaks of the disease. Now, so this was the very highly dense uh, infectious agents, which is living with these large number of hosts. What happens with the birds which are infected with these parasites, which have, which are trans which rely on these vector species. So I'm going to introduce you this system called avian malaria parasites, which is a beautiful model system. And uh, malaria is, as pro probably you know, or somebody may not, some, may, or some of you may not know that it's just not restricted to humans, actually. Birds get it, uh, even lizards get it, get it, other reptiles get it, and uh, uh, even frogs and amphibians have been known to have, but they all have their own diversity of parasites. There is no chance of cross, you know, infection across the species because it's quite evolved with the host species. In fact, the vector species also are very unique. For example, human malaria parasite is only transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. And, uh, but in birds, you have three distinct actually parasites, which is plasmodium, which is the same as plasmodium falciparum or vivex, but these are different species of plasmodium with a huge diversity. And they are primarily transmitted by Culex mosquitoes or, and then there's something called hemoproteus is there and leukocytosin. They all have their own kind of biology, how they sort of exploit the bird system, basically. I'll touch upon that in a bit. And the life cycle goes just the way we have in humans. You have an infected host, and a competent vector will come, it will bite. And that's where the, so the, so the, so the birds are where the asexual transmission of the, uh, of the parasite is there, but the sexual transmission takes place inside the vector and then the vector ends up in transmitting it to the next host basically. And uh, there's a huge diversity of these parasites. In fact, it has been sort of, we think that there might be more parasite than the diversity of birds we have on this planet. And the only reason for that we think is that because the birds are really diverse, rich group. So the jumping of the parasite or hitchhiking as I call them is, is pretty prevalent in this particular group. And if you look at the, across this map, what it shows you here is just the bird richness in the different regions. So all the really red areas are, are the high bird rich area, you know, where you have very good number of richness of birds. So you can see our Himalayan region and especially the Eastern Himalayan region is really hot spot for that. And all the black dots actually just tells you, just gives you an idea where people have done this kind of work. So aminal malaria studies have become prevalent because it's a, a, it's a very good model system to study, but it does also affect the birds. It has had a very, very negative influence. I mean, a parasite doesn't have to always kill its host, but for example, in case of birds, it does uh, reduces their reproductive success. So number of say offspring they'll produce, it slows them down. It affects their body condition. So it has been seen that birds which are infected with these parasites, they can be in a very poor condition. And actually there are a lot of experiments have been done based on this uh, hamilton zook hypothesis where you say this, the mate choice or the sexual selection is based on the, you know, how your quality of the male. So if it's a bright colored male, females always go for that because it's a sign of good genes or less number of parasites. And a very recent study has just shown that uh, the lifespan also uh, of some of the species have been found to be is, uh, is smaller or reduced if they are infected with parasites. And uh, uh, for example, if you look at the, the telomeres, you know, which is at the end of the chromosome, they're like a small caps. So the longer the size of the telomere is the longer a bird uh, or a, is, it's, a, it's actually directly correlated with the longevity. So as we grow older, this sort of becomes smaller and smaller. So what they found that birds which are infected with these parasites, they have very shorter telomeres. So they still breed, but then they manage to pass it on to the next generation. So it sort of carries on to the next, uh, so evolutionary gets selected for. 
But in very extreme cases, uh, birds do die, actually. And uh, I would like to introduce you to this system uh, in Hawaii, Hawaii Islands, where, which is actually synonymous with avian malaria. And when I'm calling avian malaria, actually, it's basically the plasmodium infections in these birds. Um, so Hawaii Island, I mean, if you guys have uh, heard about, these are a group of islands which are tucked away, you know, from the main America, North America coast, just thousand kilometers. These have been colonized millions of years ago by these finch-like birds, which have evolved into different endemic species. And they have their specialized uh, food uh, or foraging uh, guild, basically. So they are called a group of honey creepers. Now, Hawaii Islands didn't have any vector species. They evolved without any pathogen pressure. So they don't have those genes. And what happened then? They, when humans arrived, the pollinations in those islands, they brought a lot of livestock. They also brought some kind of you know, poultry with them. But until 17th and 18th century, when Europeans came there, they actually started to introduce a lot of uh, birds from different parts of the world. And the reason being they thought there is not enough diversity of birds and some of them were homesick. So they just wanted to bring their home bird species. There are a lot of birds actually introduced in Hawaii from India as well and from Africa and from other parts of the world. Now bringing bird was not such a problem until they had an accidental introduction of these mosquitoes on these islands by a ship, shipwreck actually. And uh, having a competent mosquito and these parasites on the island meant the birds, uh, the introduced birds were able to transmit those parasites to the native species. And that caused a very bad response. The birds start to die. We have lost something like 10 species of endemic birds from Hawaii because of malaria, basically. And it is only one par par parasite species there, which is Plasmodium relictum, which sort of dominates and it's a very competent, it's very prevalent in India, but for somehow in Ireland, it decimated the whole population. And these are the introduced birds by the 19th century, you can see the bulbuls are there and red bill Leothrix. And if you, and I, one of my postdoc actually was based on the system that how the relictum geography, biogeography actually varies across the world. And uh, it really intrigued me a lot that how can a parasite cause such a big havoc on these islands? And by the end of my postdoc, I had so many more questions than answers. And 20 years back, this field was really evolving. I mean, we were the first few labs who were designing the primers, figuring out how to figure out whether it's a active parasite or what's going on. What we knew at that time is that there is a kind of elevational gradient in these uh, environments. So, so when you look at this X axis where you have at the lower axis where it's just the elevation. So malaria parasites are very prevalent in the mid elevation environment. You see the red line of the vectors, which are negatively correlated with the elevation. So because of the temperature, as you go higher up on the mountain, it becomes very cooler. So it doesn't allow mosquitoes to, to live there. So what happened, we, the scientists saw there was a shift in the, uh, the bird distribution for the native birds. So all the low ha habitat, low level habitats were occupied by the introduced species, but the native birds sort of have moved up just to sort of escape the disease, basically. This whole thing was really, really mind boggling for me because we never heard of this happening anywhere else, you know, birds being killed by, uh, by these avian malaria parasite. And it really made me think that there must be system. I mean, considering India, we live here, we have human malaria parasite, which is endemic. And uh, we just sort of take it for granted. Yeah, it must be some plasmodium strain. I never heard of anybody working on bird parasites, or let alone understanding what's going on with the high elevation birds in Himalayas. And we have such a fantastic system. Our biodiversity in terms of birds and everything is so rich. And little did I know, I have no idea that what kind of even vector species might be there, but it just made me think a lot that what's happening here? Because birds follow different migration strategies. So for example, if you look at the high up in the Himalayas, a lot of birds, actually Himalayan birds, they breed in the high elevation environment in the summertime, but they winter here. This is all in our country. These are not foreign birds. These are the Himalayan high elevation birds. So for example, look at this 
orange gorgeted flycatcher. It breeds somewhere at 3,200 meters, but it winters in Dehradun. And, uh, and these ones uh, are the rose finches, pink brow. They also just stay somewhere in the foothills. So when it gets too cold, they just move down, little bit move down in the winters. And some of them come as far as down up to Bangalore or even further south. And you can imagine when these birds are making this short journey or even a long journey, they must be exposing themselves to a lot of parasites. And then they go back and they breed in those environments. So it's just a matter of time. If you find a right vector, if it's there in the future or even now, that was my, one of the hypotheses that do you have the right vector to transmit these parasites from these elevational migrants to the ones which are not migrating, which are just confined to those zones. Because my hypothesis is they might not have that much of immunity because they have sort of evolved with this migration strategy when they are not exposed to this kind of diversity of parasites. So what happens then? So I went on this journey <laughs> to look for these birds and how different birds following different migration strategy, how are they carrying and what kind of parasite? I mean, that's the first thing you need to know whether maybe I'm thinking that it's not even there. And uh, just to give you an idea, just to hear, just to briefly touch upon is, why do you think birds will migrate? I mean, how do they decide even where to go and how? I mean, of course it's instinctive. Some go very short distance, some go very, uh, you know, large distance, but actually it's largely driven by the phenology as we call, which is basically the, the study of these, uh, events, you know, which biological events like, you know, flowering of trees at certain time of year or the vegetation plays a role, which is all driven by the climate, you know, the intra-annual events. So temperature, climate, everything every year makes a huge difference. We know that migration is pretty much linked to that. Birds know how and it's happening. I mean, this is a beautiful map done by MD Madhusudan and, and he has shown here how the brown and the green is changing in a year with the change of temperature and vegetation. So this happens in birds the, from the phenology, the migration phenology is taking care of that because with vegetation brings the insect life as well because that's what they like to feed on. And this sort of goes for the, some of the migrants which we attract from the Palearctic as well. So this is one of the one which comes from Europe. It's our Central Asia, it's called light reed warbler. We get pretty much all the you know, world population which winters here for a long time in India. And you can see how they are there. They, were, they just arrived actually, and you can hear them out there. Then you also have, and they also share this habitat with other Palearctic, which also comes. So there's a paddy field wobbler, there's a booted wobbler. So you can imagine this kind of a hodgepodge going on. They might be sharing the same parasite or they can infect it. And then you have resident birds, which are actually also utilizing the same habitat. This is my one of my very favorite species called uh, uh, common rose finch, which also comes from Europe. And you can see this one comes here, but for rose finch it's pretty unique. So in Himalayan sites where I usually work, they do sort of coincide or there is a whole sympatric overlap in their habitat with the, these two Himalayan species, which is called pink browed and dark breasted uh, rose finch, where they overlap for a, some time before they take off. Uh, they go back to uh, Europe for breeding, at least the Western Himalayan population. So it, it makes you think that do they share habitat, uh, some kind of parasite or not. And uh, to do that, we started this work and we were thought we just need to sample different species for at a community level and with different migration strategies. And the way to do it to miss net, which is we set up these long nets in different uh, habitats and they it's, I mean, it's a whole science in, on its own that you need to be trained how you catch the bird, but having a bird in hand gives you so much information about its condition, what kind of fat it has, does it have a brood patch, I mean, if it's a resident bird, if it's a migrant, what kind of, uh, you know, mold, it, does it, is it molting, as you can see, this is a small feather here in mold, which tells you because molting information is just not available for a lot of species in India. And then we put a small ring on each bird, which is a small aluminum ring, which is engraved with a unique number. So in the future, if somebody catches that bird again, we will know where it was ring because these rings are, I mean, the bird ringing is largely done by Bombay National History Society. That's where we get the rings from. So we fill in a form, we'll send this information back. So if somebody comes back and asks them, well, oh, we found this bird with so-and-so number, then they can actually trace it who was the ringer and who might have caught it. And it tells you, 
it also tells you how far that bird was ringed. So you can tell how far it has lived as well. So, and you can look for ectoparasites, but in our case, we were basically looking into uh, interesting normal areas. So we take a small drop of blood and uh, we make a slide as you do for the blood smears for the human malaria and we let the bird go basically. And we hope we sometimes might see it again. And we do actually, we do have a lot of free traps. So this is what we have done in the last six, seven years. We have bringed a lot of birds and collected samples from some different species and analyzed them for bird malaria parasites. Now, the story of malaria is not complete if you don't look into the vector species, which is in our case is these mosquitoes and uh, other flies. So we do set up traps depending on the question on your sites and we sample these species. I mean, this is again a whole field in its own. Nobody can be specialized in this. So I've been collaborating with so many people on this. And, uh, but this is like the backbone. This is the main, this is the main player of this whole story because they are the ones who are driving the whole transmission. So you can't leave them out. So we've been catching these vector species as well. And uh, the one thing about designing and working on these birds and parasites, as I said, for the phenology, I mean, for birds, you can see them and you understand when they are arriving, when they are leaving. But a parasite inside the bird system, you can't see that, right? You can't even tell by looking at a bird whether you have a parasite or not, because they don't show any sign of the disease. So you need to understand this parasite biology, and there's a whole phenology sort of goes on. So from the time of year to when you should be finding the parasite in their blood to when you won't. And you have to be very careful uh, about it. So for example, what I'm just showing you here is a simple timeline. So the first point here is basically when the bird might have got bitten by a infected you know, mosquito. If you sample it, bir that bird in those first few days, you will not find any parasite. So you'll say, oh, the bird was infected. I sampled the bird. Now the bird goes through a acute phase of infection, which is this peak here, which is marked as A. Now this acute phase, when you actually feel feverish, tired, lethargic, you know, like the malaria you have when the sporozoites come out of the liver. Now these birds are the birds which are really sick. If they are out there, they probably might be hiding somewhere in the, in the bush. And if I am using my mist nets or something, I will not, I don't expect to catch them at all. I mean. They are just sitting there trying to deal with it. And then they get recovered from the infection. And this is the stage when the parasitemia is there in the blood. This is called the chronic phase. So a lot of birds, which we catch them, they are in this phase, which is the B. Basically, they have had the infection. They have gone through the thing. Now it's just carrying the infection. They survived the whole cycle of malaria. And they are living with these parasites. And if the conditions become better, then there will be a spike in parasite again, based on the, uh, on the season. So this kind of seasonality goes on. Now, migration and breeding, these are the two very stressful time for a bird, you know, because physiologically as well and from immune response point of view as well. So imagine these migrants, they are going back to their breeding sites uh, uh, to, to breed. They have to select for these sites. They have to compete with their, you know, other birds for the better sources and for the mates as well. And imagine then you're infected with these parasites. It can have a serious impact on your, uh, on your chances of on, on your reproductive success. And there are studies done which show that the birds which are actually infected, they sort of tend to leave their uh, wintering site slightly late. They have delayed arrival. So they are sort of, they lose out on the opportunities for occupying the good habitat. They have very high stress levels and, uh, and they have very low reproductive success in that response. So here's just something about the phenology. Now we got the birds and we have sort of screened them using say different techniques. You look for the parasite smears and we also use molecular techniques where we actually amplify the parasite DNA and everything. Looking at what parasite you will find in your population of your bird, what you are dealing with, you can tell which are the prevalent factors playing a role in your, in your site basically. So for example, I'm going to show you this graph here. So this is a mosquito transmitted parasite called Plasmodium. And you can see on the X axis is the elevation I am showing 1000 to 1300. And what it shows you that on the Y axis is the proportion of birds which are infected, you know, so if I say 
sample 100 birds, say 50% infected or 10% infected. It's just simple math like that. What it shows you that as you go up on the mountain, which is 3000, it is a negative correlation with the, uh, for the plasmodium uh, prevalence, as we call it, which is the proportion of birds infected. And it's a very small number, 3% of the birds, given the number of birds I'm, I have tested here. Now, this is very intriguing because what it tells you that mosquitoes don't survive in the high elevation and so does the parasite. So the birds, as you go up in the high elevation, irrespective of their migration strategy, whether they are elevational migrant or the resident Himalayan birds, not just they have low prevalence, but they, it also goes against the elevation. As opposed to these parasites, which are called hemoproteus, and they are transmitted by these culicoides, which are small biting witches. You can barely see them with your hand, in your hand. They also show the same kind of pattern. So they are slightly higher in number, 10%. But again, they are negatively correlated with, my, with the elevation. So again, which means they don't like the cold temperature or cold environment. And then this particular parasite, which is the leukocytosome. Again, it's a kind of blood parasite. It exploits both red and white blood cells. But this, is, this does really well in the high elevation. So look at the resident birds, Himalayan birds. As you go up the mountain, up to 3000, its prevalence sort of increases. But not for the elevational migrant because they are coming back from the lower you know, habitat. So they are not so much infected with this parasite, but the resident birds, which hardly are migrating, which are just there, they have this very high prevalence. So that's one way of telling. So clearly these black flies, which are transmitting these parasites, they are quite prevalent in high elevation environment. Mosquitoes are not. And it sort of proves my hypothesis that avian malaria parasites, if vectors, if I'm looking at, which is the mosquito in this case, they are not found in these environments. And plasmodium is highly pathogenic in birds because it infects both the blood and it exploits both the, you know, the blood and internal organs, causes a severe anemia in birds. And imagine these birds going up against the mountain and sort of fighting with this hypoxia and anemia must be really hard as a migrant to cope with this kind of pressure. And then trying to find a best nesting habitat as well. So we know how, what proportion of birds are infected, but we also want to know what kind of parasites are there, you know, can we tell them apart? So I'm not showing you a whole menagerie of parasites, but I just want to tell you one, there's two things here, is that within these parasites also, there's a strong element of that, whether you are a generalist parasite or a very host specific parasite. So Generalist means a parasite which can infect multiple hosts, you know, at a given time. So you are just, you just basically make yourself more available or abundant in a population by infecting any number of, and at number of species. But the host specific is something which sort of confines to a certain set of hosts. And it's largely driven by the, the phylogenetic, you know, barrier or host barrier, which plays a role here. So for example, this is a hemoproteus phylogeny I'm showing you or a clade. What it tells you that most of these homoproteus parasites are actually very host specific. So you can see this clade of timality, which I'm calling, these are laughing thrushes. They are cooperative breeders and they tend to have their own very tightly, you know, uh, closely related parasites in them. And so are the, these white eyes, which are also resident birds. They are, I mean, they're found in the lowlands here as well. And then you have these uh, blackbirds here, you have finches here. Now, this makes it a very interesting case. So do, are they really strictly host specific or do you see them sometimes a spillover into other, you know, accidentally infecting other birds? And that's something also uh, is very interesting because that tells you how frequent these cross infections are. And when I looked into that, what I found that, so this particular Clade here, this is for Blythe's reed wobbler, which I just showed you, which winters here from Paleartic region. This has its own set of parasite, very tightly linked. And I found very, only two birds so far have Indian, like in our Western Himalaya, have these spillover of these parasites in this particular street laughing thrush and there's uh, this jungle babbler. And there is no sign of parasitemia in their blood. It's just positive by a molecular. So basically it's a dead end, you know, host, they were, they didn't manage to uh, culture or they, they were not a very competent host for that. As opposed to these fringillids, which is the rose finches, which comes and, uh, you know, uh, winter here in these environment, 
And they also share the habitat with these two finches, which I showed you in the Himalayas. They have such a cross exchange of parasites because these species are so phylogenetically closely related. So this jumping of parasites is very easier for them within a family to, to cross transmit them. So that's just an example. So there are journalists as well as, and to be honest, you can be very generalist in your habitat, but can be very specialist elsewhere. So it changes with the context where you are looking at these parasites. Now, as I said, the story is not complete unless you understand the phenology of the vectors, because as I said, these are very cold environment in Himalayas. As you go higher up, we didn't find the parasite. I wanted to know, do you see the same pattern for the different vector species as well? And bingo, what you see here is for this particular hemoproteus vector species, which is chelicoides, not just the parasite, even the vector also shows you a negative correlation. So which means as you go higher up, chelicoides are also not there. In fact, if I look at the seasonal phenology of this vector emergence in the season, you can see the peak is somewhere here in August for this particular vector species, because it's too cold over here and it's too, so these are like just about the optimum conditions for it to have a peak, which also, by the way, varies with the elevation where you are. So it's not uniform. So it's all a very temperature driven, climate driven environment where this interaction between host and parasite is just driven by the temperature, one thing. And what I'm showing you here is this just a timeline for the, so for example, most of the Himalayan birds, they start breeding say somewhere around end of March to April, and they finish their breeding say by end of May or early June. This is the host breeding freedom, uh, period. But you, uh, and if you look uh, in the high elevation as well as in low elevation, but look at the vector emergence, it's coming much later than that. And breeding is the time when birds are immunologically suppressed. They spend a lot of time on the nest feeding their chicks. And that's when they are very vulnerable to these vector species. So what it tells you that even though these birds have this habitat, somehow they are sort of, there's a mismatch, you know, in the phenology of the parasites as well as for the vector species with the timing of the breeding. Now, how that shift will change in the future, we don't know. And that's why we got to do some kind of predictive work and modeling to understand how this will shape out. Will it change with the shift in the bird distribution? We don't know. So we have all this information and to understand how this will change, it's not just useful for, for the bird stuff. I mean, for human malaria as well. We know that beyond say 1500 meters, there are no cases of human malaria because as you see that the optimum temperature, it goes down up to here for say Plasmodium falciparum, and then it drops down because for parasite to develop and to transmit, it needs a certain temperature. If it's too high or too low, it won't work. Same for the Plasmodium relictum here for the bird parasite. So now we know the prevalence of the birds infected. Now we know what kind of temperature is playing. So we can actually map out those zones where this can, can or cannot happen. We can predict for the future, but having said that, what also we need is to understand that the arrival and the leaving time of the birds. Are the birds which are arriving, are they, is it just by chance that they are not infected or only the ones which are not infected or have no parasite load, they make it to their breeding site. That kind of information we don't have. And that's something really very important to understand if we want to figure out that what's going to happen in the high elevation scenario. So with this, I am going to uh, end here and uh, I would welcome some questions and hope we can, I can answer for you. But before I do that, I really want to thank uh, Bangalore Life Science, uh, Science Cluster for having me here. Both Karnataka Forest Department and Uttarakhand, they've been great in giving me permission. It's very difficult to get permission to do this kind of work in India. That's the only red line you need to cross. You can do everything. Ashwin and Tarun made those brilliant maps from Bird Count India, which I have used and which I showed you, and Madhusudan's map on the phenology. And I'm showing you this cartoon on the left, which is done by the Life of Science by Nandita Jairaj and Ash, uh, Ashima. It's drawn by Pooja, actually. They've done a wonderful story on all the women in, in science in India. And it just tells you in one page how the disease ecology works. I'll take questions now. We have. Thank you so much, Farah. That was a really exciting talk. I think there are some questions um, and I, I will uh, take the one first in the Q&A box. Um, so basically, yeah. So this question is from Sai, uh, who asks, uh, are the native birds 
uh, resident, resistant to the parasites? Uh, do they contain a strong immune system? How do they tolerate parasite attack? Uh, is it, I'm just guessing, native birds to do with the, in India or I, yeah. okay. Yes, so, um, so I think what you are referring to native birds in terms of the, the lowland birds, right, which might have been exposed to the parasites all the time, all, all year round, basically. Yes, a lot of birds actually have evolved. They do have pretty good uh, system to deal with these parasites, basically. But as I said, it, it doesn't always kill them, but it does slow them down. It does influence their reproductive success and in other ways, as I said, longevity. And we don't know. I mean, I mean for a species, I guess, which are very, say, on the verge of declining or very small in numbers, if they are infected and if they have an influence on their survival or longevity, then I think it can be an issue. Can I just maybe uh, reframe the question a little bit? Yeah. Uh, Farah, so think about whether, uh, so uh, would you would you agree that uh, in the case of something like avian malaria, it appears that, um, you know, it's uh, definitely um, uh, even malaria doesn't kill the host um, and they seem to coexist and co-occur. Uh, so this could be interpreted as resistance, but it's not. The parasite is still exploiting the host. It is very much, yes. I mean, it might be, say, fine for the, some of the birds over here, but for other species which have never experienced these kind of parasites, because not even every parasite is everywhere, right? So, I mean, for example, I mean, uh, for example, in the Hawaii case, which I was giving you, yes, those birds were not evolved with these parasites, but look at this way that those introduced birds must have brought other parasites as well, but there was only one which survived, which managed to outcompete others because it was a very virulent and managed to infect so many birds, basically. So yeah. 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 There's a bunch of questions from Venktesh. I think these are from YouTube. Mm -hmm. So Venktesh asks, is it true the dinosaurs and birds are related? Uh, how have they evolved? Uh, have they have birds evolved from dinosaurs uh, and adapted to climate change? But they have. But, uh, and also dinosaurs also have been found with malarial parasites. I mean, people have said that. In fact, some of the bird malaria, I mean, it's so ancient. It forms the basis of most of the parasite phylogeny, which we look at right now. I mean, the split has happened long ago, but it's very much very ancient. Yes, yeah. And uh, I guess the reason for diversity is that because it switches and goes around very well. How do, how, do, how do microwaves and mobile uh, changes uh, uh, affect the migration oh, so, and mobiles affect the migration of birds? Uh, and in turn, is it a reason uh, where parasites are adapting to a new type of host like humans? So, yeah, I guess there was a lot of uh, debate about it, right? That uh, uh, those the mic mobile towers tower, and everything yeah. might be, yeah. But I haven't seen any study, to be really, to be honest, which proves that point clearly. I believe, I mean, there is no evidence for that. Um, and, and actually, particularly in case of house sparrows, it was predicted, right? Like house sparrows population have gone down and because of that. But to, in Indian context, to be honest, we, I cannot answer this question from parasite perspective at all, because even though I have done this kind of work, I can't say for a species decline, it's because of the parasite or what might be going on. You need a very structured study, which combines with the bird distribution, abundance, and all kind of population data, and then see the prior parasite. I mean, there's a study in London they have done. They relate it very well with the nesting habitat and everything, especially in house sparrows. And they say that, right. Uh, the bats differ. Yeah, with the plasmodium, it ties in very well. Yeah. Yeah. How do bats differ from birds? Do they carry infections, but they don't fall sick as much as birds do? Uh, is their behavior a reason? I guess they both fly. So in, in the context of that, yeah, I, guess, I mean, yeah, birds. I mean, bats also carry their own hepatosis, you know, parasites, which are closely related to these blood parasites, and they don't cross infect or anything. I mean, it's basically. The same thing. I mean, they have evolved with these parasites and they don't sort of fall sick, yeah. Okay. How frequently do birds bear corona-like viruses? Oh, I don't know the answer for that. 
I don't think anybody. Are there has... any coronavirus is known from birds? No, I don't think so. I don't think anybody yeah. has looked into that at all. People uh, are curious about Zika also, for example. Yeah. They think, oh, forget that. Even yeah. West Nile virus, which actually harbored by birds, but we have no study in India at least for that. So yeah. Uh, is there a suitable environment where parasites can live, or do we see them getting adapted to extreme weather as well? as being part of the host i guess you kind of touched on this yeah. with your elevation yeah yeah okay there's a lot of questions <laughs> okay um, uh, okay from uh, prem kala prema uh, is there any connection of with coronavirus with this migration i guess not no yeah modernization affects the ability of birds to migrate I guess this is basically about uh, land use change and you know yeah because urbanization and all yes i mean it does affect the i mean if you create good habitat i mean for wintering birds for example habitat quality really matters so mm -hmm. if it's a very badly exploited habitat then basically it will affect the migration because most lot of birds will not be able to survive i mean yeah in, in india we don't find many birds in bangalore in recent years can you explain why in bangalore we do actually in fact the part of bangalore i live in we have very fantastic diversity of birds actually yeah i mean so there may be a change in the distribution of where birds are seen in bangalore and uh, would you agree that north bangalore has more uh, no i can't i mean no I, i will not say more or less i mean bangalore bird group for example they are so avid bird watchers and they are actively watching this bird i mean as i said for this population study you know kind of thing to actually quantify that i can't say that but there are birds i mean we see good migrants coming here every year and now with the e bird portal we can actually tell and predict you know when we should be expecting which which time of year but in terms of yeah. the number if people think they are declining i think that's hard to say but they are very much there yeah yeah and uh, maybe just to mention also farah that uh, there's <laughs> been a recent effort called uh, the state of india's birds yes yes use uh, citizen science records and try to come up with you know if there is information on the certain species are declining or not absolutely yeah that's a good resource yeah. for yeah. coming yeah. to the stuff to look at yeah that's a very uh, nice uh, book to have yeah. that have come out yeah malvika asks is there anything special in the genes of these migratory birds that helps them to survive even though they are prone to the parasites both in their homeland and in the new land they are migrating to right okay i think that's a very good question so yeah i mean there is a lot of stuff uh, uh, people have done into the the immune genes of uh, these birds you know the uh, mhc gene or even tlr G receptors genes basically and they have found that the birds which migrate actually to these wintering sites with which are really high diversity uh, from parasite they have very diverse uh, set of genes uh, compared to the resident counterparts basically so the more diverse of immune genes you have in your system which allows you to cope with these infections very well so that has been proved i mean especially for the paleoarctic migrants very well yeah great so then there's a, a a question about whether birds get fever so in captivity you know when they <laughs> do the transmission experiments when they want to see whether it's a competent host or a vector they do infect them and they do show signs of lethargy and they go sort of quiet and you know they cope with it so i would say yeah but in the wild you can't see that at all i mean as i said they might be hiding and sitting if there is a strong immune response to that you know? um during breeding season parasite load is high and parasites are less virulent so they can pass further colony or nest to nest transmission as killing reduces transmission or we don't know about such correlations so um i think uh, what i think i'm i'm hoping that this question is being asked in terms of uh, vector borne parasites here yeah so it very much i mean so a lot of work for example in in europe which they have done uh the the breeding of the birds which is in the spring time coincides with the emergence of the vector species as well mm -hmm. and that's the chance when the immune response is very suppressed and they actively transmit to the to the juveniles as well and to the other birds as well and you see a clear peak basically 
but in the autumn sort of it drops down. So yeah, it's very much triggered by the presence of the vector species. As I said, from, for my Himalayan work, I didn't see any vector species even in the breeding time of that time. So if, if I keep doing this work in the future, do I see that pattern? And it needs to be done in a seasonal way, right? I mean, for throughout the year to see that kind of change to happen. Have I, is this answer yeah. the question? Yeah, 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 I think so. But I mean, it's difficult to know whether this is, a, this is correlated uh, or caused, right? So for example, you may have uh, the vector abundance increase and that is, and the breeding season coincides with that. And that's why you see increased transmission. Uh, or is it that, um, you know, the vector emergence is driven by breeding season and uh, increase So abundance? it's as I, so yeah, I mean, it's, this is this is what I called the the phenology part. I mean, both for the from the vegetation point of view that you have nice things, spring leaves coming out, and you have caterpillars and everything. So birds, it triggers birds to breed. They arrive, they occupy the site. So that's the migration phenology, or for the birds to come. But for the vectors, because the conditions environmentally are becoming very good for them yeah. to to come out. So it's sort of the there's a match is perfect over there. But with climate change, if it, there is a shift in either of those three, with birds which we have seen, you know, the birds arrive early, but it would still not be very cold for them to occupy the sites, and probably there won't be any vectors, so they lose that breeding time basically. So any kind of that mismatch will happen, then you won't see this thing happening. But in an ideal conditions, yeah, the, the mismatch has to be there. Yeah. Are there any examples of interspecific transmission of parasites? Intraspecific. Inter. Inter. Yeah, I mean, from malaria, I mean, they do jump host, right? I mean, uh, as I said, this plasmodium relictum, which I just showed you for the Hawaiian birds, it's a highly <laughs> prevalent parasite. I mean, found in so many different species all across the globe. And uh, on the mainland and on the islands, it sort of dominates, it outcompetes everything. It's the most generalist parasite or interest that I've seen, actually. How, how do parasites affect the chromosome telomeres and reduce lifespan? Do they? Yeah, so so it's so this is this is the study which they have done in Sweden on on great reed wobbler, actually. Great reed wobblers, they winter in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, but they breed in Sweden. This is based on the 20-year study. So they found that the birds which are infected with these diverse or whatever malarial parasites, they had shorter telomeres, basically. Uh, this kind of correlation they found. And as opposed to the ones which were not infected, and they predict that it does affect their lifespan because of that, because telomere are actually related to the lifespan of an individual, both in humans and everywhere, you know, in vertebrates, basically. So, yeah. Um do birds change their natural cycles of breeding migration with respect to the life cycle of vectors and parasites? I guess it kind of goes to what we were discussing earlier. Yeah, no, they don't actually. <laughs> they they just sort of migrate. They do, they take their cues from the, from the climate, from the environment, really. So, yeah. So, I guess, you know, the way to investigate this would be to look at the costs of, you know, having these pathogens Versus yeah, this is yeah, th yeah. This is what I was saying. That yeah, that for the for Himalayan work, for example, like in, or in Europe, they have done. They they look at the birds which are using stopover sites versus which are making a direct. So how infected they are, what kind of parasite load they have. Do the ones which made it to the territory or those who occupy the territory first are the ones which are least infected or not infected at all, basically. Yeah, yeah. Are I mean, there, if, sorry, this is a question that I have. Are sure. there no you know, like, because um, you say there's a lot of variation in immune genes. You say there's a lot of variation, but are there specific um, variants which are known to uh, uh, enhance immunity for any pathogen in birds? Any alleles? Uh, like yeah, yeah. So yeah, they they have found uh, sort of this allelic association with the uh, with certain parasite lineages, depending on what's prevalent in that particular host population. They do find that kind of effect. I mean, it's just not a correlation. It's just done across you know taking certain parasit parameters into consideration. 
I have just recently published a study on using the toll-like receptor genes actually for Himalayans, one Himalayan species. And uh, we did find that uh, there is a positive correlation with certain, you know, uh, loci with the, with the parasite uh, as well and with the elevation as well, basically. So yeah, that, that has been proved very well, especially with the MHC gene. They, there's a lot of work has been done on that. Yeah, I'm just curious about for example things like avian flu um you know and because it causes such massive die-offs in poultry um is it possible yes in, in in this case Uh, there's one more question. My internet is a little yeah. Uh, I I, uh, so I, just, uh, yeah, I I couldn't hear the previous sorry, thing. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, I was just pontificating. Uh, there's another question from Rudra Banerjee asking: Is there any co-evolutionary dynamics between the parasite and the host bird species? If yes, then how top-down or bottom-up regulation would change such dynamics? How might top-down or bottom-up regulation change such dynamics? Well, yeah. yeah, I can hear you, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of the birds, which you are looking at here, you know, which are frequently infected with these parasites, you'll say they all have co-evolved. They're not dying. They get infected, they survive the infection and they are living with it. I don't understand the top down and bottom up thing here, but from coalition point of view, I mean, it's a kind of arms race which has already gone. Birds are not dying. I mean, if you're pathogen is managed to kill you, which means there is no, there's no mismatch in your co-evolution there. Can you hear me, Uma? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, I can hear you, yeah. Uh, is parasite load higher in migrating birds, which usually uh, rest during migration journey compared to those which fly continuously? Um, no, actually that's very difficult to say because each species has a very specific way of, you know, the kind of habitat they utilize and how they do it, basically. So I would say some of the birds sort of who migrate longer, for example, long distance, they tend to accumulate more parasites. That's all I can say. Uh, they have like a diverse set of parasites, but parasite load, which is the intensity you are referring to, I think that can vary, it depends what kind of parasite they have got basically and on, on their individual response as well, immune response as well. That's a really interesting point that, you know, it is more a function of an individual's genetic, whatever, some predisposition than, and, uh, you know, uh, and definitely how long they fly, but not whether they take stops or how long they take to fly and so on. So from an evolutionary perspective, there may be uh, then a selection against very long distance migrations. Um, but yet, but even then, I mean, say for example, the, these Paleoarctic migrants, which we are talking about, who, which come in winter here, that's a very long distance, right? I mean, yes. And they, they, have, they face so many challenges, it's very stressful. And they, I'm sure they all have very diverse set of genes compared to the resident other warblers, which they go and breed in those habitats. So which probably helps them to, to cope with this kind of parasite pressure, unless they, unless, because I mean, one point I want to highlight is there that uh, these birds do get infected with multiple parasites as well. I mean, they can have say plasmodium versus, and also hemoproteus infection. So that can be a double, you know, problem for the, in terms of parasite load. And that can make things more complicated for them in terms of the migration and everything. Yeah. So there's a really interesting question also from Anandita Puri. Do we see any evidence of this kind of parasitism influencing speciation and alteration in habitats? Speciation and alteration in habitat. Um, Maybe she means alteration of where you live, like niche or something like that. Um, that kind of holistic speciation. So I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get my head around the question. I mean, it's uh, but could could parasitism affect speciation? Like, uh, you know, could it be a mechanism for speciation? Say, in a community of birds. Um, 
so so what we measure i mean in terms of uh, the, the 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 presence of parasites in a community of birds is we 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 look at them say how closely or how diverse they are from each other at the at the at the family level and then also you can say look at the same information at the habitat level as well for example so so i mean yeah i mean there are a lot of studies people have done and they looked into the influence that how the generalist or sort of specialist parasites are distributed as a function of say habitat you know disturbance or stuff like that and they do tend to find the more disturbed the habitat gets you tend to find a lot of generalist parasite because there is not much because a it allows for a lot of different vector species to compete so the chances of switching of uh, parasite becomes easier as opposed to a nice pristine habitat where you have very specialist group of birds and parasites and the vectors also have opportunity to you know choose and select basically as you call basically or the opportunities for that as much higher is that answer the question <laughs> uma can't hear you yeah. yeah sorry so also just that you know is it possible for a differential infectivity by pathogens to actually cause um, you know diff like speciation uh, just like you have adaptations right so adaptation ecological you can have ecologically driven you know ecological adaptation driven speciation or diversification right i have not is it possible for differences in say ability to control parasites pathogens we don't know of any such example right no i mean maybe for on on a very like remote islands and all when we look at when there has been isolation has played a role you know and there have been niche for that kind of for a parasite to evolve as well Yeah. there are mind you we do see some endemic parasite lineages as well as you uh, explore yeah. these populations as well so yeah those can, those are examples of those and but there's not much actually done to to say so i mean when you put all the parasites into a phylogeny or look at the differences uh some can be very well represented in the population some would be very few the ones which are the few and even if they are unique they are very hard to tell is it they are unique because that's how they are or is it because something else is missing or do we need to sample more and so that sort of we don't have enough data to prove that basically yeah just that we talk about pathogens more in the context of causing extinction you yeah know? uh because uh, this die off or something like that but we're not uh, talking so much about it in the context of diversification or you know speciation but anyway yes. i think we are out of time for our it's a okay. fascinating conversation and lot more questions which we yes. couldn't answer but uh, you know thanks so much for your time and saudamini would you like to come in and uh, thank you for having just, me uh, yeah 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 thanks uh, thanks farah for a very interesting talk and uh, giving us a glimpse of how migration is uh, quite, can be quite stressful for birds and they carry parasites uh, which could uh, harm them they cope with it and then they could also give it to the humans and from the biodiversity team point of view i think it's better we we leave them alone you know if we don't encroach into their areas that is the message i am getting a uh, very very interesting uh, also conversation between you and uma and um, thanks very much to uma for hosting the four talks on the theme of biodiversity with me uh, it was a pleasure to have uh, both of you and i would like to also thank ncbs and the uh, communications team for supporting this initiative so well and thank you the audience for being with us today on another yeah. sunday morning and i hope you all enjoyed it as much as i did and we'll see you next week until then take care yeah thank you thank you, thank you. all of you thanks everyone bye bye, bye.